Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining the webinar today. Uh, we're very fortunate to, to uh, have everyone here at this time. My name is Matt Darnell. I'm the director of the sports science program here at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, we're happy to have with us here today Felix Prosol, who is a staff member with the uh, soccer team and also a doctoral student graduate research fellow at the Neuromuscular Research Lab here at Pitt. And uh, Felix was a college soccer player himself and has um, been helping out the team uh, here at Pitt with some of his sports science um, background and expertise. And we're happy to have him here today, kind of giving us an insight on how soccer can implement that today. So I'm gonna uh, toss it over to you, Felix, let you bring up your, your presentation and we could uh, get things going. Just as he's pulling that up, I'm just gonna say, you know, we'll have some time for some question and answer after this. And, and I'll also go over the sports science program briefly when, when he's done with his presentation. You could use the Q&A feature on here to list your questions and uh, I'll do the best to moderate those through and, and, and get those over to Felix. So again, thank you all for being here and, and uh, Felix, I'll let you take it away. Awesome, thanks Matt. Uh, can you guys see the screen now clearly? Yes. You can, all right, cool. Well, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it's exciting to uh, share kind of the role of sports science over the last year or so. Um, actually, two years here with Pitt Soccer. Um, we've made some good strides, and although it's virtual, I'm happy to uh, show some of our workflows um, and how we helped basically better the team. Um, so to get started, here we go. Um, a quick outline. So throughout the talk, um, basically just starting off philosophically, trying to paint a picture of where sports science fits in within the Pittman soccer program, what sort of the role is, um, how we use data to guide our decision making regarding practices. Um, and then we kind of dive more into a practical view. Um, what, what does a day look like? How do we coordinate between people and how do we um, implement the information that we collect. Um, from there, we'll uh, dive into some future directions. Um, so where can we progress from here? Where do we want, want to make future strides um, in order to get better? Then we make some conclusive remarks and through that I kind of trying to paint the picture and hope to uh, provide some compelling evidence that uh, sports science can serve valuable information regarding uh, the monitoring of performance, uh, the validation of beliefs, and then can also provide a lot of value and utility to predict performance and sessions and um, to program the loads. So where does sports science fit in within pit soccer? Um, really, it's just one piece of the puzzle. So looking at everybody that's involved with the uh, pit soccer team, you can see that there's a ton of people, a um, ton of different um, administrative people, um, all the way to the performance staff, psychologists, strength and conditioning coaches, uh, our core leadership, and then obviously the, the head and assistant coaches, the soccer staff. So really sports science is just one of those um, little bubbles of the whole network, the soccer network. Um, and if we go from a soccer centric view to more of a sports science centered view. What that means is really that um, soccer is leading the way and is providing the vision and the philosophy that is basically followed by the performance staff. Now this schematic isn't supposed to portray any hierarchy at all by any means, but what sports science kind of has a unique niche in is that basically we collect data in the uh, medical staff, the athletic training room, uh, the strength and conditioning specialists and in nutrition, like water, like hydration status, um, body composition. So really sports science has kind of this unique niche where we fuse information between all of these um, otherwise likely separated fields and bring them all together in order to make and help the, uh, make the vision of the, the soccer staff reality. So when I first started, um, really, we started um, with the sheer basics of how do we maximize performance while reducing injury. So this being a sports science talk, I'm sure we're all familiar with the concept of supercompensation. 
And so if it was a, a week with just one game a week um, and that occurring on a Saturday, um, basically Che's vision is that um, we have, we progressively reintegrate guys from Monday to an endurance day on Wednesday and then progressively taper back down onto the match on Saturday. Um, from a tactical perspective, that makes sense because we progressively also increase the pitch size and numbers of the players during individual drills during session. But unfortunately, the problem is that um, during the season, really we play almost every week twice. So what you're seeing on the right is the schedule from the 2018 season, for instance. So pretty much every week we played twice. Um, that ended up being tweaked a little bit, but um, we played 20 games in 83 days in the 2019 season. So really this um, European model isn't all that feasible. So instead of looking at it from a, a weekly basis, we look at it in terms of um, how close or far away we are from a game day. So what you can see is same stuff Monday through Sunday, but assuming games being played on Tuesday and Friday, um, we can see that Monday, for instance, is three days after a game day, but it's also one day before the subsequent game. Um, similarly, Wednesday would be the day after, but it's also two days before the next game day. And so then the question becomes, um, if this is the progression that we want to follow, how do we make sure that we actually stay within those bounds, that we have the training loads according to the philosophy and the vision of the soccer team and ensure to maximize performance in that regard. We do that by way of uh, primarily two variables from a sports science view. Um, we have um, our global positioning system with accelerometers. So through catapult, we get external loads that we couple with uh, polar heart rate monitors to get an, an idea of the internal load. And then every day we also um, ask our guys about their wellness. So through Teamworks, we distribute a, um, a questionnaire that we designed together with um, Tyler Carpenter and Frank Baroni, um, strength and conditioning um, coaches of the team. And basically that way we get an idea of, you know, how well they're doing, how hard they perceive the session the day before, um, how stressed out they are. Um, because we also know that contextual factors like, um, you know, stress in school, being a midterm week, et cetera, can influence performance. So we want to encompass all that information. Ultimately, we use those information and that data to monitor performance, to validate current beliefs, and then predict um, potential training sessions in order to efficiently program our weekly periodization. So I want to start by the monitoring aspect. Um, and usually the first question when bringing up monitoring is what variables do you monitor and why? There's a whole lot of different approaches, um, but before diving into a, a more data-driven approach, I want to emphasize that it can be just as ver uh, valuable um, to just think about this from a philosophical view and just combing through the literature. So luckily, at least in the, in the in soccer, there's a lot of data published in terms of the sprinting and running profiles of players. And what we see is basically that the majority of the time, around 70% of the time, players are jogging or walking. So it's actually fairly low intensity type of activities. The other uh, type of activity we see are short explosive actions. So that's a center forward checking towards the ball, spinning out, um, really brief distances, but uh, high accelerations and decelerations, importantly. Finally, we have long distance, not necessarily linear, but often linear runs at high speed, during which players accumulate high pace, um, which therefore present a different uh, profile for the guys. So just by identifying those three and having an additional internal load metric, um, you, that would be a really good start to begin with um, for those of you that um, don't necessarily have a data-driven background. Um, this is just to illustrate um, there's other ways to go about this as well. What's interesting, though, is when you look at it from a data-driven perspective, um, what you're shown here is basically 43 variables from Catapult. So 
you're seeing them cross correlated with one another. And the stronger they are related, the darker the color, if they're positively correlated, and um, the more reddish the color if they're negatively correlated. And then clusters, so variables that actually represent sort of the similar phenomenon are shown in those uh, brackets. And so you can clearly see that there's um, one, two, three, four at least clusters, bigger clusters um, that seem to explain or seem to be related. One of them being IMAs, so those are your short explosive movements. Then you have your sprinting or high speed distance. So again, conceptually, those are the long linear sprints during a counterattack, for instance. You have your um, volumetric measures like the player load and your distance. And then finally, you have some acceleration and heart rate measures. If we do another type of analysis um, that is known as the principal component analysis, so that's an unsupervised machine learning method, we basically get the same outcome. So fancy analyses, but really they tell you the same story. What you've shown here are two principal components that explain about 50% of those 40 variables. So you have two variables that can explain as much data as 40 variables can. And each of those arrows um, represents the contribution of individual variables to that one given variable. And so you, again, you can see one, two, three, and four large clusters that correspond and coincide with the correlations you see on the left. So this is obviously the data-driven approach. Um, the main part about this is though communicating it to the coaches. So the communication part could be just as well done um, through the philosophical view, having done this type of analysis in the background. And then it may make may more sense um, as well. So if we use those four metrics, so we have our volume metric, the distance and the play load, we have the high speed distance actions, and then the short, quick accelerations, the IMAs. Um, we plot them as a function of the day, how close they are to game day. What we can see is that we accomplished our uh, physical and tactical periodization, basically progressively tapering into game day, this being game day with the soccer ball, and then progressively increasing the loads coming out of it. So what you're shown in blue is the game day minus three, so the training session three days away from a game day, red would be three days um, after a game day. Um, all right, so with that being said, obviously we, we're already always interested in uh, figuring out, are we getting better? Um, so that's another central aspect of monitoring. Not only are we on target, but are we getting better? So how can we do that? The beauty about um, the external loads that we derive from the um, catapult is that we can basically clip sessions into individual drills. So if we just um, think of this hypothetical session here, a warm up followed by um, EPEs, so just uh, linear sprints, a rondo, a 5v2 possession game, followed by two other possess positional possession drills and then two matches, 11v11. What we can do is we can use the information from the 11v11, for instance, and then correlate um, distance, player load, and high speed distance between uh, repetitions. So doing, the, doing so, we can compute the interclass correlation coefficient, which basically just tells us how similar those two types of drills are. Now, using that information, we can calculate how much error we um, basically have in our measurement so that when we look at the changes in one variable, so the player load, for instance, from the first to the second rep, if we're outside of those uh, measurement error lines, so in those gray zones right here, then we know it's not due to measurement error, but it's due to physiological changes. So that's the monitoring aspect. Heading into the validation piece, basically, the way sports science can be used is to continuously validate and assess beliefs. What I mean by that is every session has kind of unique features. Um, we know that we want to have a lower day, the day, a lower session the day after a game, for instance. 
And so it's in our interest to manipulate external factors to the extent possible in order to reduce the loads. So not only um, do we want to have exercises that have a lighter load, but sometimes, you know, being in season, we have to have a certain tactical pattern um, because the game comes up in two days and um, we need to uh, practice that specific pattern. So the question becomes, how can we manipulate factors like uh, the inclusion of the goal, the numbers during a drill, the use of mannequins or um, sort of neutral players in order to benefit our physical goals for the session. So looking at the pitch side, the influence of pitch size and um, the numbers on our outcomes, basically this is a simple approach that just compares the same drill in the same size dimensions. We have one time a 6v6 plus two. So basically the goal of the drill is just to maintain position, either going towards goal or for the sake of maintaining position. Um, whereas the other time, same dimensions, but we have one more number on each team while there's two neutrals. And if we compare our four uh, performance indicators again, what we can see, for instance, is that in the, 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 the drill with fewer numbers to 6v6 plus two, our guys covered more distance per minute, and which translated into a higher play load per minute, but high speed distance and IMAs were similar. So if we really felt like we needed to perform this drill on a um, day after the game, for instance, and we know we want to maintain a lighter load, it would make sense to, um, if possible, have those higher numbers given the same dimensions. Another factor we can uh, manipulate is the choice of the goals. Um, going towards goal, not going towards goal, or here at Pitt, we also have the luxury of uh, different size goals. So in blue, you can see sort of the natural size goal. In yellow, we see um, a goal that's the same width, but half the height of the natural goal. And then we have mini goals that are um, significantly smaller, but the same height as these yellow regeneration goals. And same stuff, again, if we look at an 8v8 um, match play, and we want to see our, how our key performance indicators are um, influenced by that, we see that when we introduce the full field goal going towards full field goal, um, that we have a higher distance covered and higher IMAs per minute or trend towards that, while player load was also at least on average greater. So again, maybe a day after a game or two days even, um, depending on the fit of the session, we may want to avoid the use of the full side goal and instead uh, use the, the regeneration goal. So that being said now, um, those are just two examples of how we can basically manipulate the environment um, to elicit the physical stimulus we are hoping to elicit. So what that then means from a practical perspective um, is what I'm going to show you next before we dive into the prediction and uh, programming aspect of sports science. So if we were to look at the typical day, like Matt said, I'm a doctoral student at the lab. So unfortunately, a lot of times I am um, at the lab while the guys are at practice. Um, but regardless, as a staff, we meet at 6.30 usually in the morning. Uh, to finalize and make some final tweaks about our sessions. So at 6 a.m., the guys are being sent uh, the wellness questionnaire. And whenever they get up, um, they basically fill it out and then head over to um, the, the sports center. So what that means is that in, the, in that 30 minute hour span, basically uh, we have to not only collect the data, we have to clean it, because a lot of times there's missing data points. Um, people fill out the questionnaires wrong. Um, we have to analyze it, visualize it, and then finally, most importantly, communicate the results um, with the coaching staff. So a key aspect of all of this is time efficient data analysis. Um, so right now, um, 
we integrate a lot of the information in an um, open source software called R. R Studio is the IDE. Um, and basically, um, in that developing environment, we combine information from the wellness questionnaire, um, the catapult, potentially some um, body composition information from nutrition, um, or really any other data that we obtained uh, within reach. And so using that information, we then um, generate an automated report um, that tells us about the level of um, soreness, fatigue, um, stress that the guys experience. And that's really important then to communicate, obviously in our staff meetings, in order to um, most appropriately define the goals of the sessions coming up. So this is where the prediction and programming piece of sports science comes in. Obviously, we don't only just monitor, we want to make sure that we progressively um, increase the weekly training loads or maintain weekly training loads uh, to avoid spikes. Um, and so a common question that pops up at 6.30 in the morning is, what do we think today? What, what is the load gonna be? So obviously we have a, just based on a week to week progression, sort of a weekly goal. But it's really important to then consider um, those contextual factors. So what you can see here, for instance, is um, a, an excerpt of when the guys had um, some tests in a week. So just qualitatively, you can see that um, the region shaded in yellow, stress levels were increased, um, and we saw similar patterns in their sleep and fatigue levels. So less sleep, more fatigue. Um, so then naturally the question is, well, should we make any adjustments? What do we tweak? Again, this is where those repeated measures of the individual drills come in really, really handy. So we can take, for instance, all the values that we obtained during a 11 v 11 match play. So you see that uh, it's relatively broad distribution, which means um, some players had a player load per minute of 10, 11, 12, and so forth, all the way to maybe 17 let's say the most likely value was around 13 and so the question is are we going to be at 13 again um, knowing that we're more stressed out using this prior information of the guys being stressed out and the the data that we collected we can then make it draw inference um, on what we expect the new load is going to be so being uncertain which um is indicated by a relatively wide distribution in this black bar, we can say, okay, um, we believe they're gonna be worse as shown by the peak over here, but because we're uncertain, the model suggests that the decrease isn't gonna be much. So from 13.4 to initially 13.3. If we knew, for instance, that we traveled though, and we only um, had two hours of sleep and we, we, we know with great certainty that um, there are going to be some declines in performance, we can make more certain predictions, which are shown based on the smaller um, width of this distribution, which then shifts our prediction further to the left. And so then we get an idea um, using the peak, this is our most likely value to occur. Um, you know, we know that per rep, sum it up, um, do that for all other drills. And so then we can paint the picture of, okay, today, we roughly expect the load to be X, Y, or C. Um, and then we can go from there and increase or decrease on other parts in terms of the number of reps and sets. Going back to this um, workflow then, this was all basically occurring prior to training. Um, this is where we make our final tweaks, but then the guys practice. Um, if it's on the weekend, sometimes I have, uh, the luck of being able to be out there and then I can uh, life code. So we get information, lifetime, what the guys are doing, um, how close we are to our goal, etc. But oftentimes, um, basically what happens is we get done with practice and at least last year, um, the guys who would migrate to the weight room after training. Currently, we still do that a lot of times uh, within the session. But in that context, it was really important um, to provide again, quick and meaningful feedback using visualizations, um, because not only are, as I pointed out earlier, 
are sports scientists and coaches involved, there's a lot of other people um, like strength and conditioning in the weight room. And this is um, where uh, Frank, our current strength and conditioning coach, for instance, is going to tell us a little bit about how that affects his kind of work around with the guys. Hey everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's really important. One of the one of the first things, you know, being a part of the larger performance team, um, is is that you know the, these numbers are, are important, but we need to make sure we're aligning with the goals of of the head coach and in the program that we're working with. So uh, first of all, having an understanding of the microcycle and the goals of that head coach um, will we'll, we'll change some of our decision making even before we get into to some of this information that Felix can give us. Um, you know, that can be as simple as understanding what a training session is going to give you using the predictive models and then interjecting strength, speed, uh, or conditioning where, where uh, necessary. Uh, on top of that, as Felix alluded to, the, the flow of, especially in the off season, of going right from the pitch directly into the weight room in as little as 30 minutes and being able to get actionable data uh, within that time frame is, is very important for us. So based off of the, the predictions, we, we know, or we have an idea of what we're, what we're shooting for, but there are times where sometimes we'll go over that amount, sometimes we'll go under. And to have that information quickly, uh, first of all, on the right-hand side, you're gonna see just the, the first page of the daily report that we would get. So just a lot of information very quickly uh, that you know, I can scan over within 30 seconds and, and have a quick uh, idea of what happened during the session. And, and again, that can adjust the load that will happen in the weight room. And that's really important to be able to get that done quickly. As we know, athletics is done on the fly a lot of the time. So it's, it's very important that, that we have that actionable data and are able to use it fast. And then lastly, you know, it's, it's the communication between all of the parties. Um, you know, getting this, uh, this sheet, this daily report is great, uh, but followed up by a call from Felix is, is even better or a, a call from the staff in general, just to, to understand the, the, the physical cost of the session. Um, and then to have an understanding of what these variables are. So uh, knowing what the difference between an IMA and, and high speed distance is and what that will do uh, physically to the body uh, is, is paramount. And that's one of the roles of the sports scientist um, is to communicate that. You know, just for, uh, as an example, if we notice that the IMAs are higher on a day than we expected and we had planned to do some groin work or maybe some glute work uh, in the weight room, that may be something that would be adjusted uh, due to the fact that that uh, musculature might already be fatigued and we don't want to we don't want to give them too high loads in one area so uh, and you know same thing goes for high speed distance and, and hamstring work so just having an idea of that physical cost and, and what it can do for uh, towards the athletes and having that communication you know efficient and, and um, you know quickly is, is really important for us yeah thanks Frank and I, I guess that's um, a really good uh, point you're bringing up because um, I'll allude to it later again, but this is kind of where research separates itself in a lot of ways from the fast paced uh, life of athletics. So, um, you know, having practice and an immediate transitioning into the weight room, you don't have time to do a literature review and, um, you know, write a formal intro uh, to your paper. So, you know, basically it's about having fast actionable reports that allow you to make the best decision in that moment. Um, and so I think we've made a lot of strides in that regard. Um, but I just want to, um, go back to this, that even after the weight training, um, you know, the day's not over. Um, it's this kind of this constant, um, exchange of information, which often occurs informally through communications on the phone, um, doesn't have to be reports. Um, but sometime in the afternoon usually we get a medical report um, about the guys who's good to go tomorrow who's not and as i sh just showed you um just a sheer number so the availability of guys in a session can have an impact on um, the physical profile of the session and so you know having that updated information makes us reconsider okay um, what can we do tomorrow um, what types of drills should we do um, what variables should we consider in terms of the neutral players, the goalkeepers or not goalkeepers, um, those type of things. So, 
Usually that means at night we have another follow-up call, um, which continues throughout the next day then. So where, where are we gonna take this? Where um, are we gonna head with all of this information? Um, I think as of right now, really sports science is a great tool of um, monitoring the workloads, making sure we're periodizing things, um, we can predict information. But what we're really lacking is a context to the probability of success. So although we know how much high speed distance or IMAs guys were covering, really we don't know if that is any meaningful. There's actually some evidence that more successful teams oftentimes cover less distance and high speed distance than their opponents. Makes sense when you look at it from a um, philosophical view, they're in possession of the ball, they are proactive rather than reactive. And so using um, you know, the coding scheme that a lot of the uh, coaches currently use, um, there's an opportunity to incorporate some of that context, uh, contextual factors. So instead of saying um, we have high speed distance, is it a meaningful high speed run? Is it during a counter attack or is it just a run into no man's land? And so when we only look at catapult, really what we pick up is a higher load, but it doesn't necessarily mean it was um, profitable. So combining those two informations, um, we can uh, basically improve that. And that's actually something that Barcelona is starting to do and sort of the big boys are uh, doing, um, the professional clubs. Um, a recent approach is to look at um, the passing orientation of guys. So what you can see in the top right is the orientation of uh, players um, when receiving the ball in the, in, at the time of the pass being played compared to when they actually received the pass. So you can see that the body orientation largely shifted from looking uh, backwards to forward. And then as well as when they pass the ball afterwards, when they release it. We can then um, put that into different phases of the, the cycle. So the build out, build up, or the final third and quantify that for individual players. So the same concept can be applied to those physical characteristics, which would then tell us much more about the probability and their meaningfulness. Finally, I'm a doctoral student in the lab and there I do a lot of uh, neuroimaging. So naturally I have a big um, interest in decision-making and soccer is one of those sports where, like I said, oftentimes the more successful teams aren't running more. Um, whether that means they're more in procession or, or whether that means they're uh, making smarter decisions is quite unclear. What we know though is that um, decisions are important and decisions aren't being made ahead of the time. Um, really they're being made in, in the fluidity of the game. What that means is we interpret the environment, we interpret our opponents, integrate that sensory information into motor executions and so we really make split second decisions um, that don't necessarily have anything to do with the physical load that we're being exposed to. And unfortunately, um, there's not a lot of research in that area. Um, and as I have a dissertation coming up soon, if you are interested, let me know. Um, all right. So going through all of this, if there's anything you can take away from this talk is what sports science? Um, really, what I was hoping to convey is that we can use sports science to monitor performance, to validate beliefs, and tweak sessions accordingly, and then to predict and program our training loads. Um, like Frank said, this doesn't mean it's a research project for every single drill, um, because quite frankly, the, um, the environmental constraints aren't as clean enough as they would be in a laboratory settings, but that's okay. Um, that's kind of the art of sports science is being a data scientist and an exercise physiologist, but at the same time a coach, because we have to be able to um, identify the important questions, use statistical models to um, quantify those, but then most importantly, effectively communicate that uh, to other coaches and the players in order to get buy-in. Um, and so with that, I am hope uh, I'm thankful to take any questions and I uh, hope you enjoyed this talk. Uh, thanks to all my um, members at the lab and obviously 
importantly to the soccer staff for having me on board for the last two years. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Felix. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have Felix at the Neuromuscular Research Lab as a doctoral student in athletics is definitely fortunate to have him helping them out there. And um, they're also fortunate to have Frank Barone, who's a strength and conditioning coach with them. And uh, he, he's a great asset. And, and he's also uh, a, a member of our sports science program here at Pitt uh, while, while he's working there. So just two great individuals to have on your team, um, hands down. So really appreciate both of your time today, guys, as, as um, you took the time to do this. Um, what I'm going to do is, I, you know, I just want to share really quickly with everyone uh, about the sports science program at Pitt in case you have any questions yourself or, or you're interested in um, maybe doing this as well. Can everyone see these here? Good. So, you know, if, if you have more questions about sports science, you're interested in learning more about it here, we, we do have a program at Pitt, as we talked about uh, before. And, you know, just really to quickly highlight um, the program here is, uh, you know, it's a one-year program. It's, it's uh, 33 credits. If It's one-year program if you're going through it full-time within that. Uh, we're looking at developing skills and monitoring, evaluating, and improving human performance. And one of the biggest things that we highlight here is, is a hands-on experience with local sports teams and professionals. You, you do a one-year practicum with the team, um, and you're with that team for your full academic time in the program. You know, one of our... Uh, our curriculum is taught by faculty, recognized both nationally and internationally in the areas of sports nutrition, sports medicine, exercise um, science and performance, motor learning, neuroscience, and data analytics. And um, are these slides advancing? Nope. Nope. Sweet. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe you got the wrong screen. Share. Yeah, I might have the wrong sc screen being shared here. How's that? So, uh, as I was saying before, our curriculum is uh, taught by faculty nationally and internationally recognized in data science, neuroscience, motor learning, sports nutrition, and, and sports medicine. Yeah, our, our mission is to provide superior education and research and practical experiences, really to prepare students to be innovative and knowledgeable professionals in the field of sports science and we want to train leaders in sports science, working in a variety of different settings uh, to that. We have state-of-the-art facilities and equipment. We have a small faculty to student ratio, and you have access to the Neuromuscular Research Lab, which, which Felix mentioned a couple of times, as well as uh, local experts and physicians that, that provide guest lectures and classroom instructions. One of the biggest things that we're, we're proud about with this program is that it does have uh, the sports science practicum. So you're paired with the team for a full year or three semesters as you work through the program and you work with them to help be a part of their sports performance organization and team and help answer some of their burning sports science questions. We feature a lot of interactive uh, classes. We cover a lot of performance testing and every student works to complete a capstone project with their team and practicum site, again, to help answer some of those burning questions that, that some of the teams have. And if you're looking for you know, what future careers are, there's a lot of areas you could go, whether it's colleges and university, athletic settings, sports teams, private practices, and even corporate and, and business settings are hiring a lot of sports scientists now as more and more technology is becoming available to those. So some of our, our current teams, um, for some reason, it's skipping that slide. But some of the current teams that, that we have here is um, pit football, men's basketball, women's soccer, men's and women's soccer, women's lacrosse, volleyball, swimming and diving. We also work very closely with the Penn's Elite. Uh, we have student placements at Carnegie Mellon Athletics and the Neuromuscular Research Lab. You know, so why study sports science at Pitt or at all is you know, we offer a lot of hands-on experience here. It's, it's a one-year degree if you're going through it full-time. 
Uh, we do have part-time options available as well. It's, it's a rapidly growing field. You know, you could enhance athlete performance. It's very multidisciplinary. So we have students from all backgrounds and experiences who excel and do well in this field. And, and it's, it's innovative uh, within that. If you do have any questions, uh, again, my name is Matt Darnell. You could reach out to me. Um, my contact information is available on the website as well. Um, and happy, happy to answer any of those or any questions that we have right now from any of our attendees. So if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to use the Q&A feature there and I'll ask Frank and you know, I'll direct those over to Frank and Felix. While those are coming in, you know, one, one question that I have for, for Felix, and, you know, and coming as, this, as, as a prior athlete yourself and also having the data side of things, and, and you alluded to this some, but you know, what, what, it, what is the balance between um, this, this data side, sided focus to making decisions and just what we would say before is just a coach being a good coach or, or having like an eye for things or athletes or talents. Um, you know, where do you see sports science playing in this in the, in the long term? You know, is it going to be all data backed? Is it still going to be about coaches' decisions? You know, where do you see this going? Um, well, I, I, first of all, I, I agree that there's probably some discrepancies. Um, some may prefer a more data-driven approach, others don't, and that's totally fine. I think ultimately, um, as I tried to paint the picture, sports science is there to support the coaching staff. So they lead the way, they uh, propose their philosophy, and it's the, the duty of the sports scientists and all performance staff really to buy into that philosophy and help make it that vision reality. Um, so I think even if um, there, there may be some prejudice against the use of sports scientists and some coaches, I think there's still value and utility in using it to you know, address questions like, hey, I know you don't necessarily want to um, use my predictions to constrain you with the workloads you're going to have for today. But look, if you use different goal sizes, that's actually going to have an impact on how intense the session is going to be. And so then he may, the coach might be like, okay, that's helpful. You know, maybe I, I, I don't use goals on, on the first three entry day of the week. Um, maybe I, I'll stay with smaller spaces. So it, it doesn't have to be, I think people always try to paint the picture of this money ball, like to the third digit precise prediction that we're all doing, but that's, that, that it couldn't be further from the reality how it is. I think it's, it's pursuing practically relevant questions and then providing that input to the coach. And that, like I said, can occur with somebody that's really interested and wants to follow sports science, uh, sport science, but also with a coach that um, may not necessarily um, prefer to use it in the first place. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a great answer. Well, we had another question come in asking if there's any sports science and performing arts crossover. And I, I do know personally that, that I, I have some colleagues that I know that have worked in like Cirque du Soleil. They're really big into human performance and their athletes. And they, they look into a lot of these sports science aspects that we talk about. And I would say, you know, if we're talking about performance arts, as far as uh, ballet and those other types of um, practices, I feel like there's a lot of potential crossover in, in those. Any, anywhere where you're trying to optimize human performance and you have ways of tracking um, individuals and their output and their workloads, and keep them healthy. I feel like there's always a, a crossover within this. So yeah, that's a great question. Um, we had another one come in here, Felix asking you, which, which variables do you think have the greatest impact on the soccer athletes as far as heart rate, rating of perceived exertion, GPS, et cetera? Like, you know, which, which, um, which ones do you think kind of give you maybe the best insight? I think, I think that largely depends on what sport you're playing, uh, working with to begin with. I think that dictates a lot of where the answer is going. Um, I, heart rate variability, I agree, would be a, a good predictor potentially of um, sort of their readiness state. And, but on the, on the flip side, um, you know, it may not be the, the best indicator of how stressful a given practice session was. So it, it's, it really just depends on the question, what you're after. Are you trying to predict where they're going to be in the session? Or are you just curious about 
um, how tough the session was, in other words. Um, like I said, I'm kind of biased towards neuroimaging. I think there's a big gap there. Um, heart rate variability sort of hints at that question of the central nervous system state. Um, and especially in a, in a complex sport like soccer, basketball, or, or you, you just think about the fast pace of hockey, um, you have to make decisions within several milliseconds. And so obviously it's of interest um, that we're in the optimized, even though that's idealistic, idealistic, but the optimized state to make those decisions. So um, I think to go back to your question, it depends on what you're measuring, how you measure success or good or bad basically. And then from what kind of angle you're addressing the question, if it's about the load, if it's about predicting where the guys are going to be, or just basically their decision making, then you kind of end up with different metrics. Yeah, no, that's good. I, I feel like a lot of times, um, I think we get comfortable with one metric or another. And then so we, we as coaches, as athletes, as whatever it is, we put a lot of weight into it, sometimes more than what it's actually worth. Um, and it's just because we're familiar with it and we've seen it work out from time to time. So it's, like you said, it's important to think of what the context is, what, what your outcome of interest is, and then try and take a holistic approach. Yeah, so for example, um, going back to our microcycle, um, you know, it would probably be a poor choice of consideration if we looked at high-speed distance on the re-entry day as our performance indicator. It doesn't make any sense. Um, because the session is designed not to induce any high speed distance. So, you know, th there's a logical flaw, but if, if we're looking at, you know, a match play, it could, it could be a different story. Um, so that's, that's one way um, of going about it. I think just adding on to what Matt was saying, um, there's kind of also the flip side of people glorifying several um, metrics when I think that's the wrong approach as well. So I don't think there's one good variable that tells you all the answers, but it's kind of the converging evidence of multiple uh, variables given a specific context. So what type of a session it was, how close to the uh, previous game day it was. I think it's, um, we like to make simplistic views of, um, aspects of training when really it's a complex thing and um so I, I don't i don't think a univariate approach is very promising yeah and and frank you i mean you're you're on the grind day to day you're, you're you see student athletes 12 hours a day um you know and, and as as scientists as athletes we kind of get geeked out about the data about sports science about its impact um, but then I go back to thinking about times of, of being an athlete. So, you know, share with me some of your experience uh, on the student athletes level. Like how, how are they feeling about sports science right now? Is, is there buy-in from the student athletes? Um, are you seeing like that they're pushing this forward as well as coaches or, or what do you see as far as student athletes and sports science? Uh, yeah, I think anytime you can put uh, a number to something, the, the athletes are going to be, are going to be happy about it. Maybe, maybe to a detriment at, at some times. Uh, Competitive. See, <laughs> Felix and I hear the what was my player load probably more than than anything in, in trying to, you know, maybe educate that a bigger one isn't always better than a lower one. And, in, in, um, you know, but but there is quite a bit of interest, especially with men's soccer being as, you know, it's, it's really heavy. Um, there's a heavy influence of sports science with that group. Um, but I mean, uh, plenty of the interventions, in, including, you know, we have Sparta, uh, force plates and, and some other teams that pit use uh, some different uh, things that, that they can uh, put, you know, a, a number to, to something that is normally uh, subjective. And so, so I think anytime you can do that, you know, the athletes are always going to be, are going to be bought into that. And, and I think it's, uh, you know, the, the, the further we get into using it with, with our athletes and the more they have an understanding and um, of to, of to how we improve and how we um, judge that improvement, I think, you know, it's only going to continue to grow with, with their buy into it. That's great. Very good. Well, 
I don't see a ton of other uh, questions coming in right now. So, you know, we could wrap it up a, a couple minutes early here. But again, I just wanted to thank one more time, uh, Felix and Frank for coming in today and sharing with us some of their knowledge and, and experience in sports science and working with the soccer team at Pitt here. If anybody has any other further questions too, um, like I said before, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. Uh, my email address is on there and you can look it up on the web too. And, and um, I'm not gonna speak for Felix or Frank, but, but um, you know, uh, there's, I'm sure uh, if you have questions specifically for them, that, you know, I might be able to field those as well. Um, what, yeah, absolutely. So uh, again, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate you coming in. Thanks again to Frank and, and Felix. If you want to find out more about the sports science program at Pitt, look us up, um, reach out, contact us. Thanks so much, guys. We'll see everyone later. Thank you.